Good evening, 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 good evening. He was the greatest talent, comic talent, I think this country's ever produced, by a long way. What? What do you mean, come off? I just come on. <laughs> People would say, Cooper's on this Friday, and half the nation would stop, and the next day they would all be talking about his act. Uh, that's how big he was. Here's a trick now with the dice. Here's a deli. I'm not going to drag things out tonight. I mean that. I'm going to go through the act very fast, because I'm sick of it. <laughs> there is a very fine line between genius and lunacy, and Cooper certainly had his feet planted firmly on both sides of that line. In April 1984, Tommy Cooper was topping the bill in a TV special, live from Her Majesty's Theatre. During the last routine, he collapsed on stage. In death, as in life, Cooper the performer had upstaged Cooper the man. That was the one thing that he'd said for years. When I go, I want to be on stage, I want the audience laughing and everyone happy. Cooper created an unforgettable comic persona. For fans, it was a blessing. For him, it became a curse. It was the amazing delivery that made people laugh, whatever he said. And like anybody, I think there were times he desperately wanted to be taken seriously. He was trying to pursue a serious point. But it was a lost cause because people always laughed. Comedy legend Tommy Cooper was born in Carfilly in 1921. His parents ran a variety of small businesses. Tommy inherited his determination from his mother and his unique sense of humor from his father. His father could make uh, everybody laugh. It, it was just his way. I mean, if you go onto the, the beach and you, you used to have these um, deck chairs and he'd put it up the wrong way and then he'd see the the, the people that were sunbathing, um, laughing, and he'd make more of it, you see. Well, he loved to have people laughing. So Tommy took after his father um, for the fun side of it. But his mother was a very strong woman. She controlled the boys and the husband. When Tommy was very young, the family moved away to the south coast. They had an ice cream van and they used to go around all the fairgrounds in Exeter and Tommy was only a baby then and um, he was looked after by the other fairground people. Everybody helps one another in these fairgrounds and Tommy was often looked after by a chimp <laughs> to make sure he was happy in the caravans. Age 16, Cooper became an apprentice shipbuilder at Southampton Docks but he was already serving another kind of apprenticeship. The saying goes that he was given a, a magic set by an aunt, and I think that was really the start of him doing fun magic rather than serious magic. War broke out, and within a year, Cooper was drafted into the army. The tall, gangling youth made an unlikely military man. He was put into the Horse Guards Parade and became bizarrely Trooper Cooper, which, you know, is uh, made for comedy. He wasn't built for horses, and he wasn't, and horses probably weren't built for him either. It was never really what you'd call a happy marriage. The story was that he was on sentry duty standing outside the box, and he fell asleep standing up. And he opened half an eye, and he saw in front of him his commanding officer and the regimental sergeant major looking at him. And he thought, oh... And he closed his eyes, and then he opened them again, and he said, Amen. In 1943, Cooper was transferred to the battlefront in the Middle East. He went to the Armoured Car Reconnaissance Unit, I think it was called, and with, with sort of typical cooper skis, managed to get himself shot. He got shot in the right arm. In the armoured car unit, obviously, he would get shot. Realistically, his bosses probably recognised he was a Joe Loss on the front line at that stage. It was ditched by my mum. <laughs> 
The war ended in 1945, but for thousands of British troops in the Middle East, peacekeeping replaced fighting. With a restless conscript army to keep happy, traveling variety shows became a military priority. Would-be entertainers were auditioned in Cairo. There'd be blokes who played a mouth organ or tell jokes or do clog dancing, a whole number of things. Uh, and if they were any good, then we would put them on for the troops with a thousand strong audience on a Friday night. Among the hopefuls heading to Cairo was Trooper Cooper. With him went his trademark prop. One cardinal offence that soldiers must not commit was to be improperly dressed. And being improperly dressed was not wearing your cap. So if you can imagine a thousand troops sitting there and the curtains drew back and onto the stage came this bloke wearing very scruffy KD shorts, his socks down over his boots and on his head was a fez and it was a masterly stroke. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and he just stood there with this gormless grin on his face, uh, looking at the audience, and then he'd do this laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a bit more walking around now. I said to the doctor, I said, it hurts when I do that. He said, well, don't do it. <laughs> I, said, I said, no, it's serious. I've broken my arm in several places. He said, well, don't go to those places. <laughs> Cooper's anarchic act was an immediate success, and he was signed up. While touring, he realized getting things wrong got laughs. And then he'd do his first conjuring trick, which was awful. And he'd make a mistake, and he'd say, sorry, I'll do it again. And of course, they were convulsed. I'll do it again. So he did it again, and went wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> His skill was bypassing the officers who were always in the few front rows and he'd pick on some irk who he could see in the lights about five rows back and start communicating with them in order to get an identification with the audience and then he would play it big. But off stage, Cooper was a different character. He was a hard man to get to know. When we were sitting together after the show, we'd be sitting and drinking cups of tea out of sawn down beer bottles. And what I found quite clearly about Tommy Cooper is that he, he, um, he didn't join in. He wasn't, wasn't the kind of person who had a mate or anything like that. He had, as it were, for me, no personality that stood out on its own apart from his act. Cooper's need to be the centre of attention made him a difficult man to work with. Even so, he was teamed up with another popular comedian. They decided to put us together. A prestigious show, a band show, with Tommy and I doing, doing bits and pieces, and I was going to front the band to announce the numbers and so on. I found him difficult because he, he always had to put me down, you know, and, and he'd want to have the sort of best lines and so on. And um, I felt uncomfortable with him. On the stage on my own, I was fine, but he wanted to top everything all the time. And he, he wasn't a man that really he, he could work with anybody else. Thank you very much. <laughs> the double act didn't last. May I walk into a bar? Out. It was iron bar. <laughs> His jokes weren't jokes, they were silly jokes. Um, like I went to the doctors and the doctor said, D he said, I think I'm a dog. And the doctor said, well, sit down. He said, I can't, I'm not allowed on the furniture. Well, they were the sort of jokes you couldn't very well do. Double act, you know. Part of being aggressive is also a cover for being insecure. And I believe that the fundamental of Tommy Cooper was his insecurity. To his fellow performers, 
Cooper seemed nervous. He was feeling his way and he was making up his mind whether this would be better done this way or that way. And um, I, th I think he, you know, he was really just beginning to put this persona together. Stuff home, you know, because we, we were allowed to send a certain amount of stuff home, which I sent a few bits and pieces home. Blankets and stuff, that I pinched, you know, that sort of thing. And you know, black market went on, and imagine all this, all this military stuff lying about, you know. People selling uh, wheels off jeeps and that sort of thing, or even even vehicles uh, disappearing. Smuggling was commonplace. One hardly ever crossed the border out there anywhere without somebody saying, "Please take this to my brother. He'd give you plenty of money." In March 1947, Cooper was the star Billy in the jukebox show. Ten days before, he had married the show's pianist, Gwen Henty, after a whirlwind romance. All went well until the show was due to return to Cairo. It appeared that when the show had completed in uh, Palestine, he was due to come back to Egypt. Um, Somewhere on, uh, on or near the uh, Palestine-Egypt border, his three-ton truck turned over. The crash set in motion a mysterious chain of events. It could have come straight out of a kneeling comedy. But had it become public, Cooper's dreams of fame and fortune might well have been derailed. In the ensuing police investigators that they found a parcel of drugs. When the military police arrived at the scene later that day, they made a significant find. In the back of the truck was opium and hashish worth over one million pounds at today's prices. The whole show the officer in charge and, and his wife and all the other people as well. They all had to be interviewed and questioned about it all. And they were all denying that they were involved in any way. It would make a good sketch on television, wouldn't it? <laughs> Eventually, the stage manager and an Arab accomplice were charged and convicted. Embarrassed British authorities covered up the incident. Tom, you never said anything about it whatsoever. It was almost as if he didn't know that the thing had ever happened. Of course, he obviously did know <laughs> perfectly well. Cooper came home to Civvy Street in 1947, with a road-tested act and a determination to become a household name. He was determined, no matter who, no matter what, he was going to get me. Well, that must take quite some courage, but with seven years' service in the Brigade of Guards behind him, who better? to have the courage to do so than Tommy Cooper. In November 1964, Tommy Cooper opens the Royal Variety Show. Also on the bill are Gracie Fields, The Bachelors, and Scylla Black. He had made it, but it had taken years of relentless hard work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, ooh, ooh, uh. It's difficult to judge when people in the world fell in love with Tommy Cooper because it's like when people say, you know, oh, he's only got to walk on stage, and I fall about laughing. It took 20 years for him to develop this. It took 20 years for the, for the public to love, to slowly but surely love Tommy Cooper so much that they wouldn't go out at night if he was on a variety show or something like that. Doesn't sound much, does it? But five minutes from now, this place will be full of Vikings. <laughs> Tommy was one of the very few artists who was able to have a rapport with himself. But for one man to have actually have that rapport with himself and to be able to feed himself and to be able to go out and 
create that kind of performance single-handedly. There were very, very few. So that jumped the bank manager who happened to be there. <laughs> Throw that tramp out, he cried. He contaminates the air. <sighs> Them's harsh words, friend, the sailor said. The banker said, so what? <laughs> Them shooting words, the cowboy said. <laughs> Are you aiming to be shot? Tommy was always the loner. He was a great soloist. He was a great stand-up. And in real life, he looked so singular and distinctive and big and strange that he always seemed alone in the middle of the, the crowd. When Cooper first returned to Britain, he'd struggled to break into showbiz. His strange looks and bizarre act defied categorization. The BBC took one look and wrote, an unattractive young man with an indistinct speaking voice and extremely unfortunate appearance. But soon after, Cooper went to see an agent, Miff Ferry. Cooper, for whatever reason, for whatever reason took him, decided to reenact Mutiny on the Bounty with these two guys with, with the aid of hats. And Ferry apparently turned around to say, well, you know, is there anything else you can do? Cooper said, well, I can do a bit of magic. And proceeded to throw these magic gags around. The smart thing that Ferry picked up on was looking at Cooper and seeing that, that the comedy sketches and the bungled magic, if you put those two together, that would be a winner. A lifetime on the road had begun. I was soon on the merry-go-round. Cabaret, music halls, clubs, TV, the lot. I travelled up and down the country, staying at hotels and boarding houses. He was billed as Crazy Conjurer, and Tommy Cooper, he almost does a trick. But the real magic was Cooper himself. He was completely aware of his shape and all his, what was around him, his curls and, and his jaw and, and that kind of thing, his hands and, and his feet. So I think he, he really played on his size and he played on his shape and his, and his character. In 1950, he was asked to open the new studio of the corporation that rejected him, the BBC. Cooper had perfected his comic persona of stand-up comedian and bungling magician from there, it was just a short step to the greatest gig of all, the London Palladium. When you got to play the Palladium, this was, this was big. The Palladium sort of, you know, established him, firmed him up in the eye of everybody, his peers, the industry, people watching as a, as a sort of, you know, Division One performer. Riding high, Cooper took his act international, playing Las Vegas. He tried Las Vegas, and they laughed at what he did, but they didn't laugh at anything he said, because they really didn't understand a word he was saying. In fact, I worked with him for 20 years, and half the time, I didn't understand anything he was saying either. Despite this, Cooper might have made it big in the USA, but two years of solid bookings forced him to return to Britain. But America had broadened his horizons and deepened his ambitions. In 1963, he appeared in The Cool Mikado, a comedy caper. I remember he came on the set and I said, Tommy, your jokes are far funnier than our writers. So he threw in a few of his own jokes, but Tommy's jokes were only funny when he said them. He's victimizing my girlfriend. He's victimizing your girlfriend? Well, now you're talking. Bring it here and I'll fix and for myself. <laughs> I've got him here. <sighs> that reminds me, I must tell my wife I shall be home late tonight. I shall be home late tonight, love. Like many stand-ups before and since, Cooper never really made it in the movies. But escaping his comic persona tantalised him. You don't fool me. 
Tommy wanted to be a serious actor. People always want to do something that they haven't done, but there was no... I never had anything remotely possible in a serious film. Uh, a bit of character acting, because I've got acting in my blood, really, because many years ago, a straight actor bit me. <laughs> I think he once mentioned that he really wanted to be a serious actor. And unfortunately, just like Tommy ordering a cup of tea, you laugh out loud because you're Tom. But I can do it, does. I, I, I can see myself as Shakespeare, you know. And what you do is put a blonde wig on him and say, and write a Hamlet sketch and get it out of his system that way. <laughs> because Tom is a serious actor, no way. Full of overexposure and addicted to live performances, Cooper had fought shy of regular television appearances. But in the late 1960s, it won him over and made him into a household name. Two, one, ho. The heart of the Tommy Cooper show was Cooper's magic. His performances looked chaotic, but his preparations were absolutely meticulous. In the dressing room before the show, Tom would be in the dressing room and he would be fiddling with everything and checking every single solitary prop himself to make sure it was the bad prop, it was the correct prop when he wanted to do a gag that really worked. And he'd go, well, you see, the magic's still there and all that. And he was, he was brilliant with them because it was like his babies. But then this perfectionist would gleefully destroy it all. His tables were immaculate. He had two tables, so he could walk in between this beautiful walk like that. And he would... Everything was laid out perfectly. But the, every trick he'd ever did, he, it, it, it got thrown on the floor. I bet you're wondering what this is, aren't you? So am I. <laughs> it was chaos, and he would be crunching over things in the middle of the act. And it didn't seem to bother him one little bit, because it just was mayhem. He cornered hat, which revolved. He could activate it and it would spin round on his head. Tom fell in love with this revolving hat. He broke all the rules, because any other comedian would have done it once or twice for the rule of three. I think this hat revolved about seven times in the course of the interview. Always at completely unpredictable moments. <laughs> oh, dear. Here's a little trick now, watch very, very closely. <coughs> My uncle, <coughs> he's 64, and he's going to marry a young girl, 19. And this doctor said to him, that could be fatal. So my uncle said, well, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> <laughs> I just put that in, I wasn't going to do that. I mean, <laughs> when Tom was doing the act, you didn't know what he was going to do. You didn't know what jokes he was going to tell. It was all in a beautiful, beautiful jumble in his head. And what you do with Tom is you, you don't ask him what he's going to do. I mean, you get a basic of it. And he, he said, I'll go over there, just over there, and I, and I, but I'll definitely finish on this. Trust me. <laughs> no, don't trust him. From the Zeppelin cloth, I will now produce four live ducks. Oh, they got away again. <laughs> <laughs> the public loved Cooper's anarchic comedy. In 1969, he won the prestigious ITV Personality of the Year Award. He was always on the screen. He, he was like one of these omnipresent characters. For, you know, three or four years in the late 60s, mid to late 60s, he burned brighter than anyone. On the surface, Cooper's private life seemed as successful as his career. He and Gwen had been married for 20 years and had two children, Thomas and Vicky. But then in 1967, he met Mary Kay. I mean, we're just a little bit starry-eyed, I think. It was very nice. It was unexpected. I remember one of the directors said, I think he fancies you, Mary. That's very naughty. But uh, no, he, was, he was just charming. He, it, I thought he was beautiful. A lot of people thought he was an ugly bug. But I thought he was just gorgeous. Cooper would never leave his family. But he and Mary began an affair that would last for 17 years. She would become essential to his life and career. 
Tommy Cooper made a career out of ham-fisted conjuring. In truth, he was a skillful magician. He was obsessed with the tricks of his trade, as his companion and assistant Mary soon realized. The one thing that I used to say to Tommy when I first met him, what are your hobbies? And he said, magic. Magic, and that was his work, but that was his hobby as well. He never stopped working on magic. He just enjoyed doing simple things. <laughs> <laughs> He would just work with props, and it was just like watching a child play with a toy. <laughs> That's why he was sort of, he's like a child, but at the same time, very clever child. In 1967, Mary became Tommy's assistant and looked after both him and his beloved props. In between TV shows, they went on tour with Tommy's 17 cases of magic and tricks. Uh, excuse me. Yes, sir? Have you got a room for a night? <laughs> Mary drew intimate sketches of their stolen time together. She wrote, It was Margate where Tommy bought me a wedding ring, had fabulous meal with agent and friends, played the piano and sang. T and I stayed up all night, our own special wedding ceremony. A lot of people asked if I thought it would be a good idea if we'd ever get together, but no, that never, never sort of worried me in the slightest. As long as I knew he was my pal, my best pal, I was quite happy. He often stayed up all night. Cooper was a chronic insomniac and would work until morning. He used to practice all the time. He never gave up. He would always spend time going through a trick, looking at cards, going through his books. He never stopped. Off stage, Cooper the Man was hard to distinguish from Cooper the Clown. His stage persona was almost indistinguishable from uh, offstage. The voice, the manner, the way of speaking, what he was talking about. He was always on. He was always on stage or off and on, just blurred. The Cooper that they saw on stage was exactly the Toby Cooper that you'd get in the rehearsal room, that you'd get in the pub, that you'd get in the restaurant. He was exactly the same, just a little slower, but he'd always have... <laughs> He'd always be giggly and make you scream. <laughs> Here's a little trick that I watch very, very closely. Look, the red handkerchief there like that, and you go like that, there, and you go, whoop, whoop, place it inside the head like that. Here we are, there like that. <laughs> Say the magic word to myself, because it's a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it like that? Boop, whoop, bah, look at that. <laughs> Thank you! He always liked having an audience. He used to sulk a bit if he wasn't the centre of attention, actually. Uh, because you, you knew there were tricks in his pocket or a pack of cards, and you'd be dis discussing uh, China's entry into the United Nations or something, and Tom would say, this is funny, and take a pack of cards out, and the political in-depth discussion tended to grind to a halt a bit then. Cooper was happiest when performing live. Alone on the stage, the centre of attention, he could improvise as much as he wanted, and he reveled in the applause and laughter. No, not you, him. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> oh, dear, this could drive me sane. <laughs> the cliche is that the best comedians are greatest live, which is the bottom line of what they do. Live in front of an audience, no editing, no canned laughter. And it was definitely true of uh, Tommy. And good as he was on television, and he did some great televisions, I still think the, the essence of the man, you had to see him live. A live dove. 
<laughs> Live work's like missionary work, in a sense. This is where you go out to your public. And Tommy wanted to go out and meet his public, and um, he knew he was funny. And he wanted to go out and actually enjoy that. And he liked the fact that he could be on stage, wandering around, in, like, in a total world of his own, looking f or wondering what to do next, but in the background hear all this wonderful, wonderful laughter. He appeared to happily bumble his way through his act, but each show took a physical toll. When Tommy came off from the show, his clothes were absolutely soaking when he had a very heavy suit, which eventually he changed into, into this light suit, but even then he was still wet through. He was just exhausted, absolutely whacked, I think almost every single show, but at the same time, if he was happy about how it had gone, that's the only thing that really mattered for him. Cooper's remorseless schedule began to affect his health. During the summer season in 1968, he began to suffer from phlebitis, a hugely painful condition in his legs. Tommy's legs, the greatest legs in the world. They used to have to bind him up uh, later on in his career because they were obviously very painful. But you wouldn't notice it when you see him leaping about the stage for an hour and a half. Never stops wandering around like this ballet dancing thing. Now, you wouldn't know that these... But, oh, they were funny. As he would say, very visual. Life on the road was beginning to take another toll. Cooper, like many performers, was starting to drink heavily. Tom's problem was that, that at the end, when he'd be finishing in a club, that he was up, and, and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning when he'd been working... And what he want, now wanted to do was to stay up all night, you know, till 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, having a drink, pretending to eat. It obviously took a great toll on his body over the years because he never stopped. And there was a story about him in one of the Bournemouth hotels, I think it was, 6.30 in the morning, a time he didn't know existed, and the waitress came up and said, uh, what do you want for breakfast, Mr Cooper? He said, I'd like, like a bowl of cornflakes and a large gin and tonic. And she said, it, it's 6.30, sir. He said, the manager's a friend of mine. So this poor woman went away and came back within five minutes with a bowl of cornflakes, a large gin and a bottle of tonic. And in front of her, Tommy poured the gin all over the cornflakes. And he said, milk's full of cholesterol. You know that, don't you? Between 1970 and 1973, Cooper toured almost constantly. Mary was with him, companion, nursemaid, and prop maker. His preparations for a show were as obsessive as ever. There were quite a number of props to set every night. But again, he had to check on those props. He had to go and look and check that everything was just so, nothing out of place, not even a feather, I mean that. But stress and exhaustion were beginning to show. One day, Mary left two bags behind in their hotel room. I was trying to make light of the whole thing. And because I did, he got very angry and grabbed my dress, which he'd just brought the previous day. So it was all nice and new. And just pulled me off the chair and at the same time, <laughs> tore the sleeve of the dress. Oh, I can laugh about it now, but I didn't then. It was awful. Over the next decade, Cooper would become more and more trapped in his own comic creation. Empty! 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 <laughs> well, I shot for <laughs> By the late 1970s, the precise nature of the curse of Cooper was becoming clear. Despite the toll it took, he couldn't stop being Tommy Cooper. If he tried, no one believed him. And I took my mum and dad to King's Cross to get a train to Newcastle, and a station was heaving, and suddenly I saw head and shoulders above everybody else, like a neon sign, like a big sore thumb. It was Tom, and he had great big dark glasses on. 
The most vomit-making Hawaiian shirt you ever saw in your life. Shorts, Hawaiian shorts, white socks, pumps, and a brown paper bag. And I stopped, I said, Tom, he went, oh, Dennis. I said, what are you dressed like that for? And he said, I didn't want anybody to recognise me. And he meant it. Two pieces of rope, I place them in the right hand. I squeeze. And now we have one long single piece of rope. I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> The older he got, the more it seemed that he was becoming part of the public. You know, the public wanted that particular image, and he couldn't really escape from that. Cooper once said, There have been times when I have known disappointment, even despair. The public has never realised, because I was laughing on the outside, that I was crying on the inside. Even those close to Cooper found it hard to take him seriously. And we started chuckling because Tom was crying. And uh, we said to him, Tom, how are you? He said, I've broken my toe. And so we laughed more. And he had broken his toe. He'd stopped it against the stone bench and was crying because the pain was great. We had to help him out. I went to the doctor. He said, hold your breath. I said, all right. I went, Just like that. <laughs> And he said to me, look, he said, I looked at your throat. See, he said, open your mouth. I went, ha, ha. See? And he looked down, he said, oh, yes, a little raw. See? So I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just like that. He said, I went to the doctor. They'd start laughing, waiting for the joke. And he's probably going to say something entirely serious. And I think what it was was the presence and the delivery, and he was aware of it but couldn't do anything about it. The voice was so instantly recognisable and had this uh, built-in humorous undertone all the time. So it must have been quite difficult for him sometimes, I think, being serious. His career was at its peak. Cooper had become a national institution. But he himself was unhappy. On his 50th birthday, he was very depressed. He wondered what he had achieved with his life and told Mary, it's all downhill from here. He just hated the idea of being 50. Couldn't believe it. He'd been 40, hadn't he? Suddenly to be 50, he felt terribly old. Another tearful night it was. Oh, my goodness, I thought he'd never get to bed. Mm. Cooper sometimes managed to escape from his public and the limelight. He had a little um, home in Eastbourne, in Old Town. He loved it, it was his hidey hole, and, and he used to go down there for weekends, and he could go out with... They recognised him, but they left him alone, and I think that was how he sorted out all the, um, the stress of being a comedian. He found other outlets from the pressure of performing. Cooper was beginning to drink more and more heavily. A little drink would go down, uh, you know, as a bit of fuel to keep, uh, to keep you going and to, to lift you up a bit uh, for a show. All this led to a dramatic decline in his health. Mary wrote, T still suffering from leg trouble. Hence, he put his legs up against the wall until they tingled. T had a slight stroke, and it was most strange. Doctor came and put his mind at rest. Much better Friday. T and I had much peace. Very happy. I did feel that the drink helped him to forget, certainly, his physical problems and it would also sort of sustain him and give him courage to do more work. But at the same time, I think, you, I think it's possibly true that it destroyed him in so many ways, and that was very sad, but he couldn't help it. Eventually, inevitably, Cooper's act began to suffer. The TV sketches were abandoned. Now it was just Cooper, and his magic tables. 
there was a shift back to Cooper, the great soloist. We will anchor him firmly where he's happiest and has least to worry about, not the involvement in a sketch or something to do with running up and down stairs or a set or something. We will take him back to his very happy corner where he's on his own and he's completely in control. Cooper's working habits had always been eccentric, but by 1980, they had become unreliable. I suppose the most brutal assessment is that it became unprofessional because the material was disjointed, uh, it was inconsequential. Sometimes, incredibly, it wasn't funny. And uh, equally, he was missing too often down in the pub or just late, just late. And he was always late, but it got worse and worse. And eventually, very reluctantly, the Tem Thames made the decision that there was no point in going on. It wasn't as funny, it wasn't as popular, and it was taking too much time to make them. For all its originality, Cooper's act had outstayed its welcome. The world of variety that had sustained him was dwindling and dying. He was aware of the fact that variety was coming to an end. One thing that he always said to me, these lovely, lovely theatres were closing down and variety seemed to be non-existent. And he loved variety, he loved being in a variety show. No matter how childlike and, and childish he might have been, he was, he was still aware of, of the way of the world. He knew that he was, he was of the old school. He knew that he was part of a dying breed. He still made regular live appearances, and he could still get the laughs. But I'm wearing this really for two occasions. I mean, really, because elephants are frightening mice as well. And that's why I'm wearing it. No, they are. People don't know, but elephants are frightened of mice. I mean, if an elephant saw a mouse, it would run away. It would go. And this works. It does work. Because if you look around the room, you won't see an elephant anywhere. <laughs> Cooper wouldn't stop performing. <laughs> he couldn't help it. That was the most important thing in his life. And he couldn't just give it up. He would never give up. He'd have gone on till he was 90. He still would have suffered like mad, but he still needed that applause, laughter. In April 1984, Cooper had decided to appear in a live televised show at Her Majesty's Theatre in London. He phoned me up on a Thursday and he said, where have you been, where have you been all week? I've been phone, 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 phone. And he said, I'm doing live from Her Majesty's this weekend, and I haven't got a finish to the act. Well, he had the biggest finish of them all, didn't he? Cooper decided on one of his most popular routines. He would pull absurd objects out from under a huge cloak. As always, Mary was watching in the wings. When Tommy just held his chest. I think it must have been about five seconds. He just collapsed. He just sort of fell like a pack of cards. And then they brought the curtain down. I think a lot of people must have said, no, it's all right. It's just, he'll be all right in a few minutes. Of course, he wasn't. And then we went to the hospital. Quite unbelievable. But anyhow, he's in a happier place. Lucky man. <laughs> Tommy Cooper died in the ambulance, aged 63. When he collapsed on stage, half the audience kept laughing. You know, it goes back to what his manager has said when he first saw him. I didn't know. Is it, is it a joke? Is it real? I don't know. And it was like that at the very end. People didn't know. Is it a joke? Is he dead? think about it, he died on stage and people laughed because the unexpected was expected from Cooper. 
Maybe that's tragic, but he, Tom isn't a tragedy. I mean, here we are now, 10, 20 years after his heyday, still loving it. That's a, that's a, a great gift to give to the world. Cooper once said, there is something about me that makes people giggle. I honestly don't know what it is, and I don't want to know, because maybe if I became too self-conscious, I'd lose the gift. All I ask is that when I pop off, people will say, Tommy Cooper. He was a right scream, that bloke. And from one of the greatest comedians Wales has ever produced to one of the top English laughter merchants, Dudley Moore comes your way Tuesday at 9.